Hi friends, and welcome to Church Connect. The week after Easter, uh, we still are so thankful for Easter weekend. What a joy to meet uh, and connect uh, here. And of course, our four in-person services. It's so wonderful to sense the life and love of Jesus at work in people's lives. So again, thank you for joining us uh, today during Church Connect. So good to have you. Uh, we have some opportunities for you to be able to connect into community at Living Waters that we just want to make you aware of three opportunities specifically. The first is for young adults. We have the table happening on Sunday, April 16th, and we want to invite you out to that. That's a chance for, for you to be able to, to share a meal together, to be able to build a relationship and have a whole bunch of fun as well as connecting with Jesus. We also want to invite our men to Zoe Men Identity Course starting on Thursday, April 20th and the following five Thursdays. Uh, we have an opportunity for men to be able to gather and in that we find out our experiences in life, our giftings and how God has uh, moved throughout our lives and we merge all those things together to find out how we can serve uh, those around us, our family, our friends and the communities that we're a part of, how we can serve them better. Uh, and so we would invite you into the Zoe Men Identity Course. And finally, we're thrilled to be able to say that Arts Camp is just around the corner. So families, we want to give you a heads up that registration starts on May 1st. That's a couple weeks away, so you have time to prepare for that and to be able to uh, be ready to register your children. But in those couple weeks, we don't want you just to prepare for yourselves. We want you to invite your kids' friends to come and be a part of Arts Camp with them. Arts Camp happens in July. Wonderful camp. This year, the theme is Move, so we know it's going to be an awesome camp with lots of activity. So we want to invite you to that. Come and be a part of our community. All the details of those events are found on our website at lwchurch.ca. I'm already thinking about all the movement <laughs> during Arts Camp. In the main sessions, the hall uh, facility, move, move, move. Uh, I'm, I'm just already there, and it's, <laughs> uh, and it's a few months ahead, so uh, so good. At Living Waters, uh, we have five core values, authenticity, community, generosity, growing and recognizing and releasing. It helps us make decisions and prioritize things, and it's been wonderful uh, the last week or so to be updating our community on an area of generosity, specifically as it relates to an important relationship we have, and that as a church is with Langley Memorial Hospital. It's been wonderful uh, to be sharing about the sacred space renovation that's happening at the hospital, and uh, for us to be able to join with generous people within our community and businesses, giving out of our generosity fund of $15,000 to complete uh, the money that was raised in advance, up to $200,000, so that the renovation project, uh, that sacred space, uh, can begin. Uh, how beautiful it is to be alongside generous people within our community, and of course, caring for uh, the important work at Langley Memorial Hospital. So today, uh, we thank the uh, doctors, administration, all the volunteers that make that hospital uh, the best it can be for such a great community. Just before uh, we uh, move along in our Church Connect, we want to take a moment to pray. Um, of course, when we think about a hospital, we think about the people that work there, and we think about the people that they're caring for, the sick. And so let's take a moment today. Uh, if there is sickness in your life, if there is uh, someone that comes to your mind when you think about the sick and the needy, um, we all know these people. And so let's, let's, uh, let's humble ourselves for a moment and uh, uh, pray. For Father, today we thank you, on, certainly on this side of Easter, uh, celebrating uh, the resurrection and the continued resurrection of Jesus. Uh, we thank you that you are alive. We thank you that you're moving by your spirit as, and uh, the, you are continuing to demonstrate your love uh, for people through the work of your Holy Spirit. And today uh, we pray for uh, the administration, the doctors, the nurses, all the volunteers that are at the hospital today. Uh, we pray that you'd strengthen, that you unite. Uh, we pray for those that are serving today, the people that are, are moving in and out of that hospital today with sickness and curiosities and concerns. 
Pray for all their family and caregivers that come around people that were not well. We, we pray, Holy Spirit, that this would be a, a day of divine healing where supernaturally you would care for people through, through healing, through comfort, through courage. Lord, we thank you that we can turn uh, to the great physician uh, when we have need. And we do so today, thinking of those that are on our minds, close to our hearts, and of course, our broader community. May you, may you be a good Lord and Savior and healer uh, working amongst our community today. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen and amen. We'll be reading from Luke 16, verses 1 to 9. Jesus told his disciples, There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, How much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, Take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Hi, folks. Good to be with you. If we've not met before, my name is Luke, and I'm going to be sharing from our text today in the Bible. Thanks to Janet for reading that story from the Gospel of Luke. Last week, as we said, we are on Easter Sunday, but prior to that, we've been walking through the Gospel of Luke. And so we're going to pick up again now at the beginning of of chapter 16. We just concluded chapter 15, and now we're in chapter 16 of the Gospel of Luke. There's an old story of a priest in a small parish who uh, explained to his congregation that the church needed funds for a new roof. So he asked them to consider to be more than generous and offered that whoever gave the most money would have the chance of picking three hymns. After the collection plate was passed around, the priest glanced down to notice that someone had put in a large roll of cash totaling a thousand dollars. He immediately shared his joy with the church, saying that he'd like to personally thank the person who gave the large donation. A very quiet, elderly, saintly lady in the back shyly raised her hand. The priest asked her to come to the front, so she slowly made her way towards him. He told her how wonderful it was that she'd been so generous, and in thanks, asked her to pick out three hymns. Her eyes brightened as she looked over the congregation, pointing to the three most handsome men in the church. She said, I'll take him, him, and him. Well, some people are pretty clever with their money. That's one of the things that we hear in our text today, which is Jesus' parable of the shrewd manager. As you've probably noticed when Janet read that text for us, this isn't one of Jesus' easily accessible parables. In fact, it's been notoriously challenging for scholars over the years. So good luck to us today. It comes before a number of sayings from Jesus about money. Uh, But as we've been learning, the Gospels are best understood, not cut up into little bits and pieces, but taken as a whole. So this is a really good example of why reading the parables in light of the regular themes in the Gospels is not just helpful, but is crucial. Interpreting a story like this in isolation could get us into trouble, like reading it as a kind of endorsement from Jesus to go away this week and rip off your employer. Tempting as that may be, it's likely not what Jesus intends for his disciples to hear. And that's probably our first clue. Jesus tells this parable 
to his disciples. But it also seems that the Pharisees, this religious group in Jerusalem, are still within earshot as they chime in again later in the narrative. And since Jesus had been addressing them directly earlier in his lost and found parables. Luke also notes later in this text that the Pharisees, quote, loved their money, which is another clue following the parable with more sayings about integrity, wealth, and faithfulness. So though this is instruction for Jesus' disciples, it's not private subject matter. The Pharisees seem to be coming under Jesus' microscope too, as are we all when we're reading scripture. With that in mind, a simple question. Why does Jesus bring up money all of a sudden? especially following those lost and found parables. Why the sudden turn? Well, a better question is whether or not this is in fact a sudden turn in the first place. If we're to take the whole of Luke's gospel as interconnected, we'll notice that Luke's narrative has been covering themes about money, provision, and trust all along. These days, you know, we tend to draw lines between the spiritual and the material. But the Bible doesn't. It often does the opposite, especially Luke's gospel. This is the biography of Jesus that time and again asks us to consider what our relationship with material things says about the state of our hearts and our devotion to God. It's the gospel that reminds us routinely of the cost of discipleship to Jesus. A few examples can be seen simply by flipping through Luke 9 to Luke chapter 16 alone. Examples. Jesus sends out his 12 disciples. He instructs them to take nothing with them but to depend on God and those who welcome them in the towns to which they go. That's Luke chapter 9. He tells the disciples to feed thousands of people with nothing more than a basket of bread and fish. And then God multiplies the meal. That's also chapter 9. Jesus says his kingdom is about dependence, not on family, but on God first, and that though animals have homes, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Also chapter 9. Again, he sends out more disciples telling them to take nothing with them. That's in chapter 10. We're given the parable of the Good Samaritan, where the presumed evil Samaritan becomes an example of generosity and mercy, also in chapter 10. We have the parable of the rich fool, the parable of the counting of the cost before going to war by a king, and then the talk about the cost of being a disciple. That's in and around chapter 12. Then, of course, we have the preceding three parables that we've just been in the last few weeks. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost brothers, all of which are about what things cost and then God's mercy. So there's a very strong theme in the Gospel of Luke of Jesus instructing his followers about the value of things in his kingdom, how his followers should relate then to their material resources, along with this increasing tension with the scribes and the Pharisees when Jesus takes shots at their relation to wealth. So Jesus isn't roaming around, spreading a kind of spiritualism disconnected from the real world of cost and sacrifice and trust. As we've just remembered last week, Good Friday did not come cheap. It cost Jesus everything. So Luke's gospel is shot through with micro and macroeconomic effects. And we find the same theme in Luke's later work in the book of Acts, where the economics and societal health of different places is drastically shaped by the gospel in in various towns and cities. When Jesus' followers, for example, arrive in Greece to share the gospel, there's one upset businessman named Jason, and he remarks that these people have caused trouble all over the world, and now they've come here. So it's not that Jesus or his followers are spouting a new disembodied spiritual philosophy. The gospel and those who bring it are seen as troublemakers because they upset material norms within many communities like how people relate to their bodies or to money or to governments. So Jesus didn't offer folks a free course on mindfulness that will cost them nothing and promise them everything. 
the world into which Jesus' kingdom was arriving was our world. It's full of dirt and sex and debt and sweat. So fair warning to us then. Following Jesus is a real world reality. It's no cheap endeavor. And as the Pharisees found out, if we are wealthy and religious, Jesus makes demands on our dealings with money and our dealings with him. Some of us have a little more uh, than others, but most of us listening are still among the most affluent people on the planet today. So sometimes I know when I hear Jesus getting into money matters, I feel a little bit like Jason in the book of Acts myself. Don't start causing trouble in my little world too, Jesus, with your gospel that turns things upside down. It can be a little bit disturbing, but it's a disturbance ultimately for our good and our renewal. Let's talk about the parable that we heard earlier, the parable we're in today of the shrewd manager itself. First, notice that both characters in the story that Jesus tells are shady. Let me explain that. The manager is shady in dealing with his boss's business because he's been wasting his possessions and he's getting fired because of that. And he's so much so shady that he's, he's on the way out the door, but the boss uh, or the rich man is also suspect. But can scholars tell us that, that gaining interest via material goods was a common loophole used in that society? even though debt constraints were, were strict in that community. So there's some shadiness going on in business practices of the boss and of the manager, it, it would seem. So when the crooked manager changes the bills of his boss's debtors and is then commended, the boss isn't commending the manager's dishonesty. He's kind of commending his shrewdness or his sneakiness, we might say. The soon-to-be unemployed manager has not only made himself some friends on the way out the door, but he's also put his boss in a really awkward position. If the boss wants to claim the manager has defrauded him further, he'd have to own up to his own shady dealings with his debtors and the unfair interest that he's been charging. The manager may also have given the boss a good reputation in the community by lowering the bills of his debtors, and the debtors assuming that the manager was working out the boss's wishes. So the shady boss in this story, like it or not, has to sit back and admit that he's been bested by his shady manager. With no honor among thieves, it's all about clever maneuvers. And that's really the gist of this parable, a clever maneuver by someone in a shady situation. Let's talk about the meaning of the parable. Sometimes Jesus will let a parable kind of hang in midair. Other times he'll apply it directly. And in this case, he applies it. And some scholars say that helps us and others say it, it kind of muddies the waters a bit further because Jesus uh, presses the parable towards us so they reflects on our hearts. Jesus says, the people of this world are more shrewd with dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What on earth does Jesus mean? Well, first, let's knock off what Jesus clearly doesn't mean. This isn't a parable where Jesus is telling his disciples to be clever or even underhanded with money to kind of shore up a for future eternal security. The phrase welcomed into eternal dwellings, it that might trip us up. Is Jesus telling his disciples to, to use money to buy a bitter bed of bit, sorry, a, a bit of a better piece of heaven? That's probably a too simplistic a reading, even if it is a mouthful. And it also runs against the rest of, of scripture. This isn't about buying a better piece of eternity for ourselves. Jesus then is probably getting at a few things when we read this in the wider context of the few chapters around it. First, we should notice this is a parable of contrast. Jesus tells a story with crooked characters to tease out the point about shrewdness, even a kind of worldly wisdom. If we were to oversimplify the parable, we might say that Jesus is telling his disciples with the money-loving Pharisees within earshot to be smart 
about their resources in light of eternity. And this is how parables sometimes work. They ask us to consider the principle less the example. So Jesus isn't saying, go out and do this, but just consider the principle that's at work here. In light of eternity and Jesus' present kingdom, are his disciples thinking wisely about their stuff? Are they learning to live with what we could call a kingdom shrewdness? In a moment, Jesus will warn about money's tendency to master when it's loved or when it's hoarded. So, be money smart, says Jesus, but under a definition which might be new to you, an eternal definition. You can't serve two masters. You can't worship God and money. So pay close attention to your dealings with both. Second, zooming out again to consider the theme of money and the heart throughout Luke's gospel, there's a question here of what that kingdom shrewdness or what kingdom smarts look like in our material world. For Jesus, the instinct to hoard or to place confidence in wealth is simply something that he calls foolish. As we see in other passages, the wise instruction for his followers is not to trust and worship money, but to trust and worship the creator of all material things. Go to the source, Jesus says. Don't look for the material, go to the source of the material. All of Jesus' teachings on money are about the avoidance of idolatry, which leads to death, and the invitation to trust God as the source of our provision. And that same essence is drawn out in this parable when Jesus instructs his followers to think about dealing with money with eternity in mind. One scholar says that Jesus is urging his followers to invest in homes that last. And that's the aforementioned kind of eternal dwellings, which sounds similar to Jesus' teaching of storing up treasure in heaven in Matthew's gospel. So Jesus is not only warning about money's potential to master his disciples, but challenging them to be proactive in their handling of it. The instruction is to avoid tying their energies and resources up in ways that don't align with him and his kingdom, as it's the only kingdom that will last in the long run. Third, even though Jesus is giving his disciples this parable, as we mentioned, um, the Pharisees are also under the microscope. And there's going to be a back and forth with Jesus and the Pharisees in the next verses. When we think about the preceding parable of the two lost brothers, or what some call the story of the prodigal son, at the end of that story, what is the elder brother concerned about when he gets hot and bothered about the party being thrown for his younger brother who's just returned? Is he concerned about his father's affections or reputation? Or is he mostly concerned about what he's owed? What does he say? You've never given me anything. If the older brother is meant to stand for Israel's religious leadership, as many scholars would, would say, then Jesus is calling their devotion to God into question in these next few lines. Here in Luke 16, things get really heated. People can be touchy about God, money, and security. Why? It's because material matters are always matters of the heart. So this next parable of the crooked manager uh, may be as much a teaching for Jesus' disciples as it is a warning, even a knock to the Pharisees. By way of this parable about crooked business people, Jesus may be saying that as wise as the Pharisees think they are with all of their rules and all of their wealth, they're actually foolish. Your rules won't save you. Your self-imposed self-righteousness won't save you. All of your money won't secure you. What master are you really serving? Invest in what will last, Jesus says to his disciples. Be smart about this. So what on earth does this parable have to say to us? Well, first, it's one of those parables that seems very much for the first audience. We have to say that. 
um, and for the churches that were reading it as the gospels were being circulated in the first and second centuries. As the good news was spreading, as churches popped up over the years after Jesus' death and resurrection, the first Christians were challenged to think about how their relation to money operated in light of their devotion to Jesus. Under persecution or hardship, would they hoard or would they share? Would these new Christian communities follow the lead of the scribes and the Pharisees who loved their money, giving people who had more resources special attention or privilege? Or would they follow Jesus' lead and make room for everybody equally? Jesus had been very clear. They had to count the cost of following him with integrity day in and day out. And we read all about this in the early chapters of the book of Acts. This kind of message was was no doubt as challenging for Jesus' disciples to hear firsthand as it was for them to teach and model in those first churches. So this is a parable, many scholars would agree, for then. But to say that this isn't a parable for now is too easy and might be too tempting given the subject matter. Who can say that they're wise when it comes to God and resources and choices and our trust? Who doesn't find security and wealth a very tempting God to serve? You know, sometimes we get awkward when the Bible gets direct about money or sex for a reason. They are formidable idols, easily served in secrecy. I think a thousand practical questions tumble out of this parable, don't they? What should Jesus' followers avoid? Uh, What does investment in homes that last look like day to day? What are kingdom money smarts? How do I discover them? We could think about that personally. We could think about that as a community, as as a church. For example, how are we using our energies or resources as a church? Are we going in the direction of Jesus' kingdom? Or are we tied up in superfluous or foolish investments of our time, our energy, and our resources? Do we draw all our confidence from a sound financial report at an annual general meeting? All right, the money is looking good. We're going to be fine. Or do we draw our confidence from the God who gives and takes away in his sovereign wisdom? There's an urgency, I think, in this parable. And it's right for Jesus' people to feel that urgency. Don't waste resources on things that that won't matter in the eternal kingdom. We all have choices and can be smart or silly about our life's investments. As the Templar Knight at the end of the last crusade says to Indiana Jones, choose wisely. I think there's some encouragement in studying the book of Acts further when we think about the gospel of Luke. How did the first Christians share what they had and provided for one another with an eternal mindset? One of the great joys of being a pastor in a church is seeing how people share what they can in Christian community. It never ceases to amaze me when I see the generosity at work in our church. Time, gifts, money, physical assets, Just recently, we shared about how collectively we've been able to give towards the Langley Memorial Hospital. And that's a wonderful gift that we're doing together. But we also do things as individuals or as family units. Again, just recently, a family in our church opened their home for a number of weeks to host Alpha, where people who are brand new to faith could be hosted well, could be cared for, and could explore in a safe, warm environment. They took what they had and they offered it as a blessing with an eternal mindset. And we could share so many examples beyond that. Often it's not about what we have or don't have. It's about what we, what we do with what we have. One of the things that we should hear from Jesus in this teaching and in any of his words on resources and trust is that money and our relation to it matters. Jesus doesn't teach that God wants our money. If that were the case, Jesus would be no different than the countless human enterprises with designs on our bank accounts. Jesus actually raises much higher stakes. God has designs on our whole being, including our resources, material 
or otherwise. Our dealings with money are simply a gauge of our heart's alignment with our Creator. The challenge is from Jesus. The cost of discipleship is to put resources, relationships, sex, family, ambition, goals in their place. As we drive along, Jesus says, put those things in the back seat, maybe some of them in the trunk, not in the passenger seat, giving us overbearing directions. Jesus is the one buckling up in that passenger seat, providing trustworthy navigation at every turn. You know, we hold five core values as a church. We talk about them often. And they're not simply intended to sit uh, as a few nice words on a wall. Because real authenticity with God and one another is a daring thing. Community in an age of rampant individualism is difficult. Generosity in a society obsessed with materialism and entertainment is a challenge. Growing in maturity to become more like a servant-hearted, sacrificial Jesus is difficult. Recognizing and releasing our time, our gifts, our resources will take intention when it's tempting to hoard with a scarcity mindset. But we're trying to hear Jesus through these values, to go his way in this place, in this time. The message today from the parable is really rather simple. We're all a bit foolish. We can all be easily deceived. So let's be smart about this and follow Jesus in his wisdom by adopting an eternal perspective, by aligning with his character and kingdom. Now, some of us are especially money smart, right? Some people are incredible with that kind of thing. But as Jesus followers, we're all called by him to grow daily in our kingdom smarts and to choose with what we have wisely. Thanks for joining us for Church Connect. It's been so good to have you with us. Why don't we take a moment to pray as we close? Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you that uh, you speak to us about our lives and what is happening in our lives today. And so, Lord, we do ask that you would give us wisdom, wisdom in how we live our lives, how we carry ourselves, how we interact with, with finances and how we interact with the people around us. Lord, we do ask for wisdom. Lord, we also ask that you would, you would help us to trust you. Help us to trust you with, with our possessions. Help us to trust you with, with our relationships and help us to trust you with, uh, with all the things that that we hold dear to us, that we would actually trust you more than all those things. So Lord, we ask for those things and ask for your Holy Spirit to move in in our lives. Lord, we want want to be closer to you. We want to have you as the center of who we are. So help us to move in that direction. In your name, Lord, amen, amen. Thank you for joining us at Church Connect. It's been great to have you. Have a wonderful week. God bless as you go through this week, and we will see you next week.